Thank Peter Lutheran Church, we are very pleased that you are joining us for worship this evening. Today we continue our Lenten series, The Crucial Hours, and we, um, tonight, what to remember when you are seized with remorse. And we see that Judas was sorry for his sin, but we need to talk about what was different between him and Peter, and why one was reinstated and one was not. With that in mind, let's begin our worship by singing our opening hymn, Hymn 109, 109. Man. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty Lord, we have come together to stand in your presence. We have come to, hear your word. We have come to confess our sins and repent of them. Lord God, you have brought us safely to this solemn hour of Lent. Open our hearts to receive your forgiveness of joy. We thank you for the gift of your Son, the Christ. You use this time to strengthen and renew us. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God and ask him for his forgiveness. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you that I have not loved you with all my heart, and what I have done and left undone. I have pursued my ways instead of your ways. I have not loved my brothers and sisters as myself. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. I am truly for my sins. I repent of them 
I beg for your mercy, O Lord. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us. The Almighty God has been merciful to us and has sent His Son to die for all. For His sake, God the Father forgives our sins and calls us from the darkness into His marvelous light. As a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Our Passion Reading, Lesson 6. Two other men who were criminals were led away with Jesus to be executed. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. They offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. They crucified him there with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now it was the third hour when they crucified him. Pilate also had a notice written and fastened on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this notice because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But that this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one part for each, of, for each soldier. They also took his tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it. Instead, let's cast lots to see who gets it. This was so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So the soldiers did these things. Then they sat down and were keeping watch over him there. People who passed by kept insulting him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Those who were crucified with him also insulted him. In the same way, the chief priests, experts in the law, and elders kept mocking him. They said, he saved others, but he can't save himself. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he wants him. Because he said, I am the son of God. One of the criminals hanging there was blaspheming him, saying, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, since you are under the same condemnation? We are punished justly, for we are receiving what our, we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Amen, I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene were standing near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time, this disciple took her into his own home. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun was darkened. At the ninth hour, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. After this, knowing that everything has, had now been finished, 
And to fulfill scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. Immediately one of them ran, ran, took a sponge, and soaked it with sour wine. Then he put it on a stick and gave gave him a drink. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Suddenly the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks were split. Tombs were opened and many bodies of saints who had fallen asleep were raised to life. Those who came out of the tombs went into the holy city after Jesus' resurrection and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were guarding Jesus with him saw the earthquake and how he cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last, They were terrified and began to glorify God, saying, This man really was righteous. Truly this was the Son of God. When all the groups of people who had gathered to see the spectacle saw what had happened, they returned home beating their chests. All those who knew Jesus and many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and who had served him were there, watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, Salome and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Since it was preparation day, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses over the, over the Sabbath because that Sabbath was a particularly important day. They asked Pilate to have the men's legs broken and their bodies taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who was crucified with Jesus and then those of the other man. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. Immediately, blood and water came out. The one who saw it has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. Indeed, these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Again, another scripture says, They will look on the one they have pierced. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, was a good and righteous man. He had not agreed with their plan and action. He was looking forward to the kingdom of God. He boldly went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised that Jesus was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had been dead for a long time. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph bought a linen cloth, came, and took Jesus' body away. Nicodemus, who had earlier come to Jesus that night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 72 pounds. They took Jesus' body and bound it with the linen strips along with the spices, in accord with Jewish burial customs. There was a garden at the place where Jesus was crucified, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. So they laid Jesus there because it was the Jewish preparation day, and the tomb was near. Joseph took the body and laid it in his own new tomb that he had cut into the rock. He rolled a large stone over the tomb's entrance and left. The woman who... The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed after Joseph, and they observed the tomb and how Jesus' body was laid there. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, was there watching where the body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes. On the Sabbath day they rested according to the commandment. On the next day, which was the day after the preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered in the presence of Pilate and said, Sir, We remembered that this deceiver said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise again. So give a command that the tomb may be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples might steal his body and tell the people, he has risen from the dead, and this last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, by sealing the stone and posting a guard. Here ends this evening's Passion reading. We confess our faith with the second article of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. Let's continue with our next hymn, hymn 108. Him 108. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Tonight our sermon text comes to us from the Holy Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 27, verses 3 and 4. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he felt remorse. He brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders and said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? That's your problem. This is God's word. Dear friends, as each week we see more and more fulfillments of Scripture by the only one who could fulfill them, Jesus Christ, our Savior. When we hear certain names, we automatically associate certain names with that person, certain things with that person when we hear their names. When my children hear my name, the first thing that they would think of is not as I am their pastor, but I am their dad. When my wife would hear my name, she would say, that is my husband. Dad or husband are not words that the members I serve would associate with my name. They would say, he is our pastor. But as I preach this sermon here at St. Peter, you associate with pastor as Pastor Steves. And rightly so, because 
He is your pastor. And of course, the pastors that meet at our circuit meeting are not pastor and then our last name. They're Joel, Dave, Will, Jim, and any others that might be there. And not their last names, because we associate each other by our first names. When we think of Jesus' first disciples, some are better known than others. When we hear about Peter, certain things come to mind. He is bold. He is one of the three special ones that was chosen to be with Jesus at special times. Peter, James, and John. If we were Catholic, we might claim that Peter is the first pope, even though scripture clearly says that he had a wife, considering Jesus healed his mother-in-law. Paul also says that the apostles are free to take along believing wives if they want to, as Peter does. So we know that Peter made a good confession of Jesus. You are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God. We know that it was Peter who denied him three times. There are other disciples that we can say, we can't say a great deal about. Or we do know them for some things. James was executed for his faith, first one to be executed. Brother John was the only disciple not to suffer martyr's death, as he wasn't killed, he was exiled to an island called Patmos. We think of Thomas as a doubter, yet he was the one who said, let's also go to Jerusalem that we may die with him. It was Thomas who said that. Not Peter, not James, not John, but Thomas. Like Thomas, we don't hear much about Philip or Andrew. And while we might know someone who has the name of one of the disciples, my brother-in-law, my wife's brother, is Peter. And of course, she was supposed to be Andrew because Andrew was Peter's brother. Obviously, she's not Andrew, (laughs) thankfully. How many people do we know that are named Judas? We may know lots of different disciples, Thomas, Peter, James, John, but not Judas. And while this was a popular name, popular name at Jesus' time, the book of Jude is the Greek version of Judas, one of Jesus' very own brothers. We don't hear that. No one would name their son Judas because of what we associate with that name. And even though he had seen the miracles, he heard all the teachings. He betrayed the Lord of life. The Almighty God in the flesh. What leads up to this text tonight is very important. Let's spend some time looking at what happened right before this text. Judas is the one who makes the offer to the the chief priests. They are out looking, hey, this disciple or that disciple might betray him. He went to them. They didn't approach anyone else to betray Jesus, even though most of the people knew how they felt about Jesus. Probably all the people knew how they felt about Jesus. But they don't approach anyone. Judas approaches them and says, what will you give me if I betray him? But what happened is that Judas provided them a way to get Jesus. And they offered him something in return. From this text, it's obvious that Judas hadn't really thought through what they might do to Jesus. What would they actually do? Would they punish him and let him go? Would they expel him from Judea and ban him from ever returning? What would they do? Is it really that serious? What would they do to him? All that was on Judas' mind was this would be an easy way to make some money. 
They already don't like him. And I'm one of his closest disciples, one of the 12. Maybe I could make some money. Maybe they'll punish him, let him go. Who knows? And maybe he thought that if he would even, that even if he would betray Jesus, Jesus could just miracle his way out of it, as he did at other times. When they pushed him to the edge of a hill to throw him down the cliff, he just walked through them. They couldn't even lay a hand on him. He just walked right through them. A miracle. Or, Scripture says, his time had not yet come, so no one laid a hand on him. Maybe Judas thought, well, he'll just miracle his way out of this as well. So we get to Holy Week and the Passover, and Jesus predicts his betrayer, and then Judas leaves before the institution of the Lord's Supper. Before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus predicts Peter's denial. But before we are too hard on Peter, Scripture tells us, when Peter said, I would die for you, Lord, Scripture says, and all the other disciples said the same thing. But we know, other than John, who was probably a teenager, all the others were nowhere to be found. They're not at the foot of the cross. John is, probably because he was a teenager, he wasn't of legal age to be prosecuted, like these other men were, that were nowhere to be found. They all deserted Jesus. And then we have Jesus' arrest. First we know that there is no basis for this arrest. Usually something must be done if you are going to be arrested. The arrest took place at night, which made it fairly secret. Secret arrest at night because the people would not have allowed this to happen in broad daylight. They were, they were afraid of the people. Pharisees, they always say that. But they were afraid of the people. Secretly, at night, they came after Jesus as an insurrectionist. This is a better translation than robber or thief. I mean, the word insurrectionist can be thief or robber. But Barabbas was offered to the people, and he was not a thief or a robber. He was an insurrectionist. We could even say the insurrectionist on the cross, who was promised paradise, Makes more sense. Because he wasn't crucified for stealing something. He was crucified for a major, a major crime. Then after the arrest comes the trial. This is a fake trial. Because the verdict was in before the testimony of anyone. In fact, the verdict was in before Jesus was arrested. Let's put Jesus to death. He's guilty of this. Let, now let's go arrest him. And after this fake trial... Jesus is handed over to Pilate because the Jews, they were not allowed to execute anyone. The Romans would let them set up their own rules. You do your own regulations and rules for your religious things that you do. But they couldn't execute anyone. So, Jesus has committed a civic offense, an insurrection, or whatever they want to say, to make something stick with Pilate. By a name, we know a person's reputation. The Eighth Commandment protects a person's reputation, and we follow this commandment by taking a, word, a person's words and actions in the kindest possible way. We readily think of Thomas as a doubter, which would ruin his reputation. Thomas wasn't a doubter. Thomas was the main apostle for spreading the gospel to the West. Maybe he didn't go any further than Spain, but he was the one who went West. We know that to be true. He is just as important as any of the other apostles in spreading the gospel. This is just one example to be careful about drawing conclusions without all the facts. Our goal is the same, and we... Not only as St. Peter, but we, as a church body of a synod, want to be, have 
We want to have a reputation for sharing the gospel. That's what we want to be known for. We are people who want to share the gospel. After the fake trial, we have the words of this text. In verse 3, we easily see that Judas is sorry for his sin. What did Judas think was going to happen? Jesus predicted his death and even how he would die. Jesus said, they will crucify me. Wasn't Judas listening? What was he thinking? Wasn't Judas listening? It appears that the judgment of condemnation comes as a surprise to Judas. Now he's condemned all of a sudden. I didn't know this was going to happen. He brings the money back, and it, it appears he's trying to make amends for his wrongdoing. He's throwing that money back into the, into the chief priests and the elders. And he tries to make amends for his wrongdoing, which is exactly the same thing that the sinful nature always does. Even the prodigal son returning, I will say I'm not worthy to be your, be your son. Treat me as a hired hand. When the father should have said, get away from me, go away. Find work somewhere else. That sinful nature is always trying to figure something out. And that's what he's doing here. So how is Judas different from Peter? Judas does confess his sins. Peter wept bitterly, which we could say, I guess, that these bitter tears were also a, a certain type of confession. The tragedy of Judas could have ended the same way that it ended with Peter, a reinstatement into apostleship. But the chief priests and elders failed Judas. They were the ones who were really responsible for the judgment that Jesus had to die. Judas, don't worry about it. It's really on us. We're the ones who want him to die. We are the religious leaders. Why didn't they point Judas towards forgiveness? You were with him for all these years. You know him. He'll forgive you. It's not what they did. Judas' eternal suffering in hell after his suicide is God's just judgment, but even in his final hour, could have been or could have been prevented by repentance. So how do we handle our sins? Do we consider them as serious as they are? Do we make a defense for why we did what we did? After all, the word apology means a defense. When our Lutheran forefathers wrote the apology to the, Aug to the Augsburg Confession, they weren't saying they were sorry for writing the Augsburg Confession. They were making a defense of what they had said in the Augsburg Confession. So is that what we do? I apologize. I'm defending my actions. Does that really make a difference to God? Do we try to convince God that we had a good reason for what we did? Well, we had a good reason. Do we forget that sin is sin? Let us remember that repentance contains four parts. There must be a confession of our sin. Having a committed a sin as believers in Jesus, we are truly sorry that we have committed that sin. We wish we hadn't have done that. We then turn our focus to Jesus and trust in him for forgiveness full and free. And then being set free by Christ, we are free to change our, li our lives to live more closely with and for Jesus. We wish that we had not failed but when we do, we are not driven to despair. 
Instead, we are driven to the cross. The best thing to remember when we are seized with remorse. Amen. And now may the peace of God that transcends all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand and let us pray together Luther's evening prayer. We pray together. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. Forgive me all my sins and graciously keep me this night. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Let us now continue with our closing hymn. Hymn 588, we will sing verses 1 and 2, and then verses 6 and 7. 588. 